Part 2. The Science Behind Why Belief Breakthrough Creates Permanent, Life-Changing Results According to Harvard professor Gerald Zaltman, 95% of our thoughts, emotions, and learning occur without our conscious awareness. Most cognitive neuroscientists concur. Neurofocus founder Dr. A.K. Pradeep estimates it at 99.999%. Dan Ariely, professor of psychology and behavioral economics at Duke University and author of Predictably Irrational, The Hidden Forces That Shape Our Decisions, concludes from years of empirical research that we are pawns in a game whose forces we largely fail to comprehend. David Eagleman, neuroscientist at Baylor College of Medicine, an author of Incognito, The Secret Lives of the Brain, adds that consciousness is the smallest player in the operations of the brain. Our brains run mostly on autopilot, and the conscious mind has little access to the giant and mysterious factory that runs below it. In this section, we'll shed light on this giant and mysterious factory and learn the science of how we create our limitations. As we turn the light on to illuminate our subconscious mind, we're empowered to become more conscious. And as we do so, we become more free and powerful. Chapter 9. How Our Brain Works to Limit Ourselves Our brain is wired for limitation. That's the bad news. The good news is that by understanding how our brain works, we can harness and leverage it to work in our favor rather than against us. Bruce H. Lipton, Ph.D., is an internationally recognized stem cell biologist, a well-respected pioneer in the cutting-edge field of epigenetics, the study of how our genes can be changed by environmental factors and the power of thought, and the best-selling author of The Biology of Belief, Unleashing the Power of Consciousness, Matter, and Miracles. According to Dr. Lipton, the subconscious takes in 20 million bits of information per second, conservatively. In contrast, the conscious mind takes in 2,000 bits per second and can process a maximum 40 bits of information in the same time. In other words, our subconscious mind perceives and processes incomprehensibly more than we are consciously aware of. We have the ability to consciously interpret very little of everything we are taking in. Have you ever seen the online video where researchers ask you to count how many times people pass a basketball and then afterwards reveal the crazy and incredibly obvious thing you missed as you focused on counting? If not, check it out and other similar examples here, http colon slash slash www.theinvisiblegorilla.com slash videos dot html. Trust me, if you question the assertion that our conscious brain only registers a small percentage of what our senses actually perceive, these videos will make you a believer. In light of this, here's the critical question. What does our brain tend to focus on? If we can only make sense of very little of what we are perceiving, what will we actually see? What we see is based on shortcuts the brain routinely takes, which evolved largely in response to threats to our survival. As science writer David DeSalvo writes in his book, What Makes Your Brain Happy and Why You Should Do the Opposite?, Years of neuroscience have led to the current understanding of the brain as a prediction machine, an amazingly complex organ that processes information to determine what's coming next. Specifically, the brain specializes in pattern detection and recognition, anticipation of threats, and narrative, storytelling. The brain lives on a preferred diet of stability, certainty, and consistency, and perceives unpredictability, uncertainty, and instability as threats to its survival, which is, in effect, our survival. Psychologist Dr. Rick Hansen adds that our brain has developed in response to threats to create a pervasive negativity bias that makes us prone to feeling threatened. Our early ancestors faced serious and daily threats of being eaten, stomped, poisoned, etc., as a result, 
Our brains are constantly on the lookout for bad news and hypersensitive to apparent threats. We zero in on bad news and fixate on it with tunnel vision. Good news, on the other hand, is essentially ignored. In effect, Rick says, the brain is like Velcro for negative experiences, but Teflon for positive ones. He further explains, Basically, in evolution, there are two kinds of mistakes. Number one, you think there is a tiger in the bushes, but there isn't one. And number two, you think the coast is clear, no tiger in the bushes, but there really is one about to pounce. These mistakes have very different consequences. The first one will make you anxious, but the second one will kill you. That's why Mother Nature wants you to make the first mistake a thousand times over in order to avoid making the second mistake even once. This hardwired tendency toward fear affects individuals, groups, from couples to multinational corporations, and nations. It makes them overestimate threats, underestimate opportunities, and underestimate resources. We also learn from Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habit, Why We Do What We Do in Life and Business, that the brain is constantly looking for ways to save effort. Left to its own devices, the brain will try to make almost any routine into a habit, because habits allow our minds to ramp down more often. This effort-saving instinct is a huge advantage. An efficient brain allows us to stop thinking constantly about basic behaviors, such as walking and choosing what to eat, so we can devote mental energy to inventing spears, irrigation systems, and eventually airplanes and video games. Here's what all of this means. We get wounded and then create false beliefs in a misguided attempt to protect ourselves from further wounding. False beliefs are essentially a conditioned shortcut to keep us safe. So what we tend to focus on as we're taking in 20 million bits of information per second are the things that we perceive to either, number one, pose a threat, or number two, offer a reward. And these perceptions are all seen through the lens of our false beliefs. As we subconsciously sift through mountains of data, our false beliefs determine what we see and focus on and how we interpret our experiences. This is why we can't even see breakthrough opportunities, even when they are right in front of us and plain as day. Our brains will literally not allow us to see things outside the parameters we have set with our false beliefs. Consider this belief. If I stand out from the crowd, people will make fun of me. That belief gets filed away and creates a shortcut to save you energy and time when you encounter situations that appear to threaten you with humiliation. And it does actually work to keep you safe from such a threat. The question is, what is the cost of such protection? What opportunities does it prevent you from taking advantage of? What learning and growth does it stifle? Furthermore, does humiliation really even hurt us? And can we choose whether or not to feel humiliated? Again, we create all these false belief shortcuts subconsciously as children without being aware of what we're doing and the long-term effects they will have on our future choices. Then, as adults, we have no idea that this programming even exists. This is exactly what our brain is wired to do. That wiring may have served us well to save us from tigers in the bushes in the past, but in our modern world, where environmental threats are minimal, that wiring works against us. Our brain makes our beliefs true. As I've said, whether our traumas are real or perceived doesn't matter. The mind processes perceived traumas in the same way it processes real ones. Experimental and clinical psychologists have proven repeatedly that our nervous system can't tell the difference between an actual experience and an imagined experience. In other words, our brain makes our beliefs true even though they are not truth. In one study, volunteers were asked to play a simple sequence of piano notes each day for five consecutive days. Their brains were scanned each day in the region connected to the finger muscles. Another set of volunteers were asked to imagine playing the notes instead, 
also having their brains scanned each day. Consider the results. The top two rows in the image show the changes in the brain in those who played the notes. The middle two rows show the changes in those who only imagined playing the notes. Compare this with the bottom two rows showing the brain regions of the control group who didn't play or imagine playing the piano. Incredibly, the changes in the brain in those who imagined playing the piano are the same as in those who actually played the piano. A 2013 study from the Karolinska Institutet in Sweden further showed how imagination can alter mind-brain function. Christopher Berger, a doctoral student at the Department of Neuroscience and lead author of the study, said, We often think about the things we imagine and the things we perceive as being clearly dissociable. However, what this study shows is that our imagination of a sound or a shape changes how we perceive the world around us in the same way actually hearing the sound or seeing the shape does. Specifically, we found that what we imagine hearing can change what we actually see, and what we imagine seeing can change what we actually hear. Another researcher in the project, Professor Henrik Ersson, reported that this is the first set of experiments to definitively establish that the sensory signals generated by one's imagination are strong enough to change one's real-world perception of a different sensory modality. We can choose to view and interpret the world and our experiences optimistically or pessimistically, and depending on our lens, we alter our perceptions of reality. Author Christopher Berglund wrote of the study that Mental imagery and visualization can alter how we perceive the world around us. To a large extent, your mind can create reality at a neuronal level. By choosing to look on the bright side and see the proverbial glass as perpetually half full, the world around you will seem more hopeful and full of possibility. As far as your brain is concerned, what you imagine to be happening is actually happening. In other words, Whatever you choose to believe, you get to be right. Your brain literally makes it so. Whatever you interpret manifests not only in your beliefs and your paradigm, but on a physical level in your nervous system and stress responses. As Bruce Lipton puts in his book, The Biology of Belief, science recognizes that the fate and behavior of an organism is directly linked to its perception of the environment. In simple terms, the character of our life is based upon how we perceive it. We see what we want to see. Once our beliefs are created and embedded in our subconscious mind, we find evidence to support them, and we filter out evidence that contradicts them. Our world only makes sense if we're right, and our brain will do anything and everything to make our beliefs right. If I believe that I'm a fat person and there's nothing I can do about it, then all of the evidence I see in my life will confirm this belief. Subconsciously, I will eat in ways that create fat. My lifestyle will prevent me from losing fat. Unless I change my belief, it is literally impossible for me to lose weight and keep it off. My brain will not let me. This is true because of a psychological phenomenon called cognitive dissonance, a term created in 1956 by a social psychologist, Leon Festinger. Wikipedia defines cognitive dissonance as a discomfort caused by holding conflicting cognitions. Example, ideas, beliefs, values, emotional reactions, simultaneously. In a state of dissonance, people may feel surprise, dread, guilt, anger, or embarrassment. The theory proposes that people have a motivational drive to reduce dissonance by altering existing cognitions, adding new ones to create a consistent belief system, or alternatively by reducing the importance of any one of the dissonant elements. Put simply, it is a psychological mechanism that drives us toward internal consistency between our beliefs and behaviors. Festinger coined the term after observing the reactions of a UFO cult when their prophecy that the world would end on December 21, 1954, failed to materialize. Rather than conforming their beliefs to reality, 
they simply changed their beliefs. Their founder proclaimed that they had spread so much light that God had decided to save the world from destruction. You and I may not believe in UFOs, but we do mental tricks that are equally as crazy on a daily basis. We perceive everything that happens to us through the lens of our pre-existing beliefs. If anything seems to conflict with our beliefs, we simply alter the data to fit into them, or we ignore it entirely. We cannot live with cognitive dissonance, so we perform mental acrobatics to be consistent so that our world makes sense. When Blake was in the fourth grade, he was placed in a group for kids who were more academically advanced than their class members. His mother told him, Just remember, you're no better than anyone else. From that point on, whenever he thought about playing harder or aspiring higher, he heard her voice and backed off. He never gave his full effort because of the belief he adopted, I can't play full out at 100%. Underlying that was the belief that extra effort and achieving excellence were somehow wrong. As an adult, in a subconscious effort to prove these beliefs as true, he settled in every aspect of his life and learned to be content with mediocrity. He approached relationships as temporary. He enjoyed people's company until they grew tired of him and then he started over. He allowed his body to deteriorate into poor health, which resulted in depression, diabetes, and low energy. He never pushed for a better career or income. His spirituality suffered because he failed to give any effort. When Wendy was nine years old, she lived with her biological father and stepmom. In their blended family, there were 12 kids living in a tiny house. One time she was in an argument with her younger sister. Her sister Kathy, who was six years older than Wendy, came to intervene. The argument escalated and her younger sister started telling Kathy stories of things Wendy had done to her. When Wendy tried to explain and defend herself, Kathy slapped her across the face, grabbed her by the jaw, and screamed at her to shut up. Hurt and infuriated, she tried to say more, but Kathy's mind was made up. Kathy then grabbed her hair and threw her into her room. She had to stay there until her parents got home from work. When they did, Kathy played the sweet girl and told them it was all Wendy's fault. Wendy said as little as possible and apologized. Her parents sent her to her room for the rest of the evening without dinner, and she cried herself to sleep. Wendy created the belief, I can't say what I want or how I feel because what I say upsets people. She decided that she wasn't worth listening to, that she doesn't matter, and that she makes people mad when she talks. As an adult, Wendy has subconsciously worked hard to make these beliefs true. She told me, I say what I think people want to hear, and that doesn't work because it's not coming from my heart. My words sound fake and rehearsed, and a lot of times really intense to force my words to be heard. Sometimes I ask for things I don't really want. This has caused a lot of confusion and frustration in my relationships. This has especially cost me a secure and stable relationship with my husband because I don't open up to him the way I want to. I don't know how to express my true feelings and I hold back what's in my heart. The only way for Blake and Wendy to change their results is to change their beliefs. The same is true for all of us. Our brains will literally not allow us to perform above the level of our beliefs because we can't bear to live with inconsistency. Unfortunately, in order to maintain consistency, most of us don't change our beliefs. Rather, we conform our lives and results to fit into the tight box of our beliefs. The joyful, fulfilled life we really want is right in front of our faces, but we fail to see it because we perceive only limited options through our limited beliefs. Belief breakthrough allows us to expand our consciousness to see more hope, love, joy, and possibility in the information that we consciously process. More precisely, we can train our brain to seek out a reality that will best serve us. 
what if we could retrain our brain to only see the opportunities that enable our best self to manifest? When we view information through a negative lens, we gravitate toward limiting beliefs when we experience cognitive dissonance. The opposite is also true. Belief breakthrough allows us to intentionally step into cognitive dissonance by consciously stepping into a positive thought. Conscious positive thoughts outweigh the negative. The brain is a great servant, but a horrible master. If we are running our lives on autopilot, with little or no understanding of what's going on under the hood, then our brain is the master. It steers us to where our false beliefs lead. Ultimately, this results in self-destructive behavior, unfulfilling relationships, financial struggles, an inability to achieve goals, poor self-esteem, and a million other undesired results. The only way we can take control of the steering wheel is to become consciously aware of the false beliefs we created as children and then reprogram them into truer, more empowering beliefs. Because of modern science, we know how our beliefs create pathways in our brains that we habitually use. Imagine walking through the grass of the savanna. As you walk, you stomp down the grass. Eventually, by taking the same route every day, you create clear trails. But some of the paths put you close to dangerous cliffs and animals. Conscious belief breakthrough work is like using a bulldozer to carve out a new trail that is safe and designed to free us to live our limitless life. Here are some selected quotes on the topics discussed in this chapter. The consummate truth of life is that we alter our destiny by altering our thoughts. The mind is our most crucial resource, our crowning asset, our ultimate arena of battle. Dennis Deaton If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is. Infinite. William Blake The reward for conformity is that everyone likes you, except yourself. Rita Mae Brown The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. John Milton we act, or fail to act, not because of the will, as is so commonly believed, but because of imagination. A human being always acts and feels and performs in accordance with what he imagines to be true about himself and his environment. Maxwell Maltz It is a paradoxical quality of human nature that we tend to downgrade ourselves while upgrading others who possesses no more and often less, talent for attaining lofty goals. Melvin Powers You have available to you, right now, a powerful supercomputer. This powerful tool has been used throughout history to take people from rags to riches, from poverty and obscurity to success and fame, from unhappiness and frustration to joy and self-fulfillment, and it can do the same for you. Brian Tracy As a single footstep will not make a path on the earth, so a single thought will not make a pathway in the mind. To make a deep physical path, we walk again and again. To make a deep mental path, we must think over and over the kind of thoughts we wish to dominate our lives. Henry David Thoreau